Hello and welcome out to the Dice Tower. I'm Wendy Yee and today I have another rapid fire roundup for you. So this is where I briefly talk about a bunch of different games. I share my scores and my general thoughts on them. So let's go ahead and get started. Come Sail Away is a Sashi and Sashi game and this is themed around a cruise ship. So you're basically drafting people that come in a specific order and then you need to place them in rooms that are adjacent to each other in that specific color order. And you're trying to fill up rooms with whatever those room requirements are. Some are the same color, some are different colors, some want variety. Um, there's just a variety of different things. And as you complete rooms, you get bonuses. So in this game, it's, it's really simple, like the concept is really simple, but the actual like choosing where to place stuff out um, is a good little puzzle. But at the same time, it's so clean and so simple that Chris taught her daughter and she just got it. Like we played and she just understood. And in fact, she won one of the games that we played. And so this game amazes me because it's got a cool puzzle, but at the same time, it is very streamlined and simple, uh, but not simplistic. And so I enjoy it a lot. I think it's fun. Um, it doesn't take very long to play. And so I just feel like it's a really good game. So I'm giving Come Sail Away an 8.5. Um, definitely a good game and worth trying. Arabella. Now this is touted as an approachable 18xx game, roll and write game. Um, it was one that I was excited about. It also has this cute cat and a train on the front, so it was very disarming and I thought, okay, cool, an 18xx game that's very approachable and we're going to be able to play and it's not going to take too long. And I have to say, I was sadly disappointed. And so we just really tried to figure out if we were playing some of the rules wrong. We reread them and reread them and reread them and I, the, the rules are not well written as it was. Um, but the real struggle with this game is you, you've got your map and you're building out and it, it seems like it's going to work out, but the actual drafting of the dice is a big struggle. So as you are drafting these dice, um, you basically take all of the same number. And so you're like, okay, well, there's five fives. I'm going to take all those fives. The next person gets to choose, you know, there's one, one, they choose that one, one, and they go around. Uh, but the problem is, is that we played multiple rounds and the first player never changed, never changed. And you could say, well, that's just how the dice rolled, whatever. But the person who's picking those dice has a little bit of manipulation that they can do with the rest of the dice. And so you can keep setting it up so that that first player doesn't change. And guess what? That first player may get to draft two or three dice compared to the last player, which only gets one die. And so automatically, like that just ruined the game. It made it so that, you know, one player is taking three times the amount of actions as other players for most of the game. That doesn't make sense. And so we we really tried. We tried to figure this out. And Chris and I thought, you know, are we going to take this home? Are we going to try to house rule it? Are we going to make up, you know, I mean, make up our own rules to try to make it work? And at the end of the day, we thought this is just not worth it. So that's why it's not getting a whole big review. It's just in this little rapid fire roundup kind of thing, because it was a hot mess, a hot mess. So this is getting a two. I'm very disappointed in it. It was one I was super excited about. And wow, development, please. Playtest, please do all of that. Oh, it was a mess. So Arabella, two. Unicornia, this is a very pink unicorn based kids game. I'll tell you what, if your kids love unicorns, this is a game. It's very unicorny. Um, I didn't love this as a game for me to play with my daughter just because I don't feel like there's tons of choices. It's a little bit better than a roll and move, but not much. So there's unicorns and you're trying to save them by walk walking around this map and collecting items. So at least you're choosing which direction you're gonna walk, but ultimately you need items and you need to give them to unicorns so you can save the unicorns. Um, it's very, very simple. I could see maybe if my daughter was really young and really into unicorns, maybe I'd play this with her, but there's so many other better games out there for kids that are still interesting for adults. This was not there for me at all. So I'm gonna give this a four. Maybe it's fine but I think it's a very, very specific scenario that this would even be interesting for, um, for really anybody to play. Our daughter thought it was fun. She's like, oh, this is cute. But I don't think she'd have more than a couple plays in her before she'd get bored with it because it's just very simplistic. So there you go. That is uh, Unicornia. Give it a four. Cascadia Landmarks is an expansion to the base game of Cascadia. And it basically adds a, just a couple different things. So it adds new scoring cards, which are very similar to the previous scoring cards. They just switch things up a little bit. So the animals still basically 
act the way they did before, but maybe just have a little bit of a tweak to them. And then they add these landmark tokens. So basically when you get um, like an area of, I think it's five of a particular landscape type altogether, you can add a landmark icon or token to that area. And then you get to get an individual scoring card of your choice. And that lets you do like something very specific for your scoring. So I think the the changing the general scoring cards for everybody, I felt like it was fine. They were such minor tweaks that I didn't feel like it changed the game and it made it feel like, ooh, this is a whole new thing. Um, they, it was very vanilla. But adding the landmarks was interesting because you're trying to get those larger regions already because you want to get those majorities and stuff. Um, but adding in the landmarks gave you these these specific cards to work towards specific goals. And so I feel like that added more. So I'm going to give this expansion a seven. Like I said, the scoring is very vanilla, but I think the landmarks make it worth it. So this one I approve of. I have two games that I'm going to lump together next, and these are the Unfold games. So I have uh, Dark Stories and then Victim of the Pyramid. Uh, Dark Stories looks like this haunted house on the front, and I definitely thought it was going to be like cool ghost stories or something. It's not. You're just like trying to escape from a prison because you're a crazy um, evil scientist or something like that. Um, it definitely taking that haunted house cool vibe that I thought it was going for and a totally different story ended up happening. There was a disconnect there for me um, just thematically. Now the Victims of the Pyramid one did fit the theme. Uh, it was very Egypt pyramid-y god stuff. I think your friend was like kidnapped and you're trying to break into the back of a pyramid so that you can save your friend kind of thing. Um, and you go through a bunch of puzzles. So, you I mean, the one is a prison break. The other one is a pyramid enter kind of thing, but they're both full of puzzles and stuff. Uh, very, very escape room-esque, what you would typically see in a lot of those kind of escape room games. Um, so one thing about the pyramid game is it had a whole lot of names that you were reading all at once. And they were all a, like Egyptian gods. And it definitely was confusing because there were so many names you were reading. And I think even if they weren't these Egyptian god names that I just didn't know, I think even if they were regular names, there were just so many of them that I was like, okay, who is, even if it was in, like, if it was like English, it would be like, who is Sally again? Which one, which statue is Sally associated with? Oh, that's Sally. Um, so they're definitely like, I struggled reading it with a partner because playing with someone else, you want to read it out loud. Um, I struggled reading it and then those names really mattered so that I had to remember who was who and what icons they were associated with and it just was a lot. So minor note with those two things. Um, the actual gameplay was very similar with both. They had um, you slowly unfold and you have these little puzzles that you're trying to figure out as you unfold each new layer. You complete a puzzle and you get a new puzzle. Um, it's a cool idea where you don't have to have like a super app based thing like a lot of these other um, unlock or escape style games. And um, I thought that was cool. It also had plenty of clues and the clues you would just associate with the top. You would just open up a little flap and I guess it's replayable because you could close everything. But I think once you've opened those flaps, they kind of stick open. Um, so it's kind of replayable, kind of not. You can fold it all back up and put everything back in. Um, but I think the clues worked out. I think that we were able to solve all the puzzles based on using the clues and not, you know what I mean, and just figuring it out. One thing is I did feel like they started with heavier puzzles and kind of got easier and lighter as you went instead of vice versa, where I prefer my escape rooms to have lighter puzzles at the beginning. At the end of the day, I feel like it was, hey, let's move to another room and do another puzzle. I didn't feel like the theme really carried it through um, and I didn't find it extremely interesting. I did play both. I finished both. They were fine, but I didn't find them to be greatly rewarding stories. So I'm going to give them fives. Um, I know that was a lot of longness to basically say, like, it was very fine. It's a fine game. I think at the end of the day, I'd rather play one of the other escape room games that are app based. Um, but this one's fine. And honestly, it's easy to carry somewhere. It's very small and compact. So at the end of the day, like, it's OK. It's OK. It's not a bad escape room game. If you want to try it out, it can be worth it. Secret number is a group deduction game where you are um, trying to figure out what the secret numbers are on the table. Um, and slowly you're getting information about what numbers everybody else has. As you are playing these cards and trying to figure it out, you're slowly making guesses by playing out cards. Um, 
And one, I think one of the biggest, like, determines for me for this is, like, it's fine. It's a fine little deduction game. I guess it's okay. Um, but you're really rewarded for making terrible guesses at the beginning. Because if you make the correct guess on accident at the beginning with almost no information, you get a lot more points than later on if you guess it correctly because you had the correct information. And so it just feels like, okay, it's just worth it to randomly guess at the beginning and then hope that you got correct. And if you didn't, oh well. So it it takes that deduction and then adds a whole bunch of luck to it at the beginning. And it just, it's very unengaging. So I'm giving this a three. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't think it was fun. Um, and I don't feel like it's worth my time or effort. So there you go. That was secret number. Scholars of the South Tigris is a Shem Phillips and Sam McDonald game. And this was one I was really excited about because I do tend to enjoy their games. And this is in the South Tigris trilogy. Um, and so these designers tend to pick a mechanism and they just kind of change it up from what you've ever seen in other games and they make a difference. So the South Tigris uh, trilogy thus far has been doing dice. There's been a lot of like interesting dice manipulation in ways we haven't seen before. Thematically, this game is about ancient texts and trying to uh, recruit different scholars that all know different languages. So eventually you can translate these texts into Arabic um, and that's the end goal. And so, you know, you may you may find someone that knows Sanskrit or someone that knows a, you know, Hebrew or something like that. And they like slowly translate them so that eventually you can get to Arabic. And that's how you get most of your points. What does that have to do with dice? Well, this game is all about rainbow dice and you're making combinations. So you have a variety of different tracks. You have like the basic primary colors of tracks that you're trying to move up on. And those are a little bit easier to do because um, the dice come in primary colors. They're like the easier dice to get. But eventually throughout the game, you're trying to mix dice and you're trying to combine the colors so that you can move up on the secondary color tracks like purple and green, you know, these like um, mixed colors. And so it's fascinating how we have this game about like ancient texts, but also we are manipulating dice by literally mixing them together. <laughs> so um, you have workers and on your turn, you're playing an action, you're spending a die, and then you can spend workers to change those dice. If it matches, you can change the number. If it's a different color, you can mix those colors together so that you can move up on the colors that you want, or you can take the actions based on the colors that you want. It's not just tracks, it's it's other stuff too. Um, and so it's it's fascinating from like this, this art standpoint, because I love I love board games as art. Um, as trying to discover new mechanisms and really trying to see what we can do with board games. Um, but also, it's an interesting game itself. Like, it's it's a little bit of a, a brain burn because mixing those colors together and trying to figure out what you need to do to get the thing that you want um, is complicated. So it's definitely not a light game at all. Um, but also like I'm fascinated by it because this use of coloring is so different. So I'm gonna give this a 7.5. Um, I think as a game, it's a good game. I'd recommend it. Um, it might not be as high as some of their other games just because the mechanisms are a little bit wah in my head, like it's a little bit much, but also I'm fascinated by it. And I think it's so cool that they created something that's so unique and I want to see this done um, almost in a more simple way like I'd be fascinating if they like simplified it or if some other designer took that and really like springboarded off of it with this idea of mixing colors and stuff. So fascinated by it, 7.5, great game. Fox Experiment, I saved the best for last. Uh, Fox Experiment is a sort of roll and write game. You're rolling and you're writing on these fox cards and you're trying to breed foxes together so that you get more of the attributes that you want. And I guess this is some historical science experiment that was done um, that I don't know a lot about, um, but it is historically based. One thing that I love about Fox Experiment though is that you get to roll a lot of dice by the end. Initially, you start with some very basic foxes, you get a couple benefits and you roll a couple dice and then those dice you add up together and if you can place things together, you're like, cool, I got little bits of more of these um, Punit square things, attributes, little attribute traits. And so you're slowly, you know, adding those in and now you have a new fox that you put out on the board and that can become a parent fox for future rounds. And so um, you then take that one that's now upgraded and you mix it with some other foxes and now you have more dice to roll. And so every round you get like more and more dice to roll and um, 
it's just, it's fascinating because you're working towards a couple goals, but you're also working towards just getting a lot of foxes. And so there's a variety of things that you can do. It's not too complicated and you get to roll a ton of dice, so many dice and make so many decisions. So I think that it it's fun how this um, takes kind of what we know is a roll and write game where you have like a sheet of paper, you roll some dice and you fill out your sheet of paper. Instead, this really mixes it up by having the actual cards that go out in the lineup and change. And um, it's just very interactive and dynamic in that way. And so I think that it's very cool what Fox Experiment does. I'm giving this a nine. I think it's fabulous. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, and it definitely fits that theme as well for people that are very thematic gamers. Um, you're literally breeding foxes together, which is fascinating. I guess literally, I guess it's more figuratively. Ooh, is that a literal or figurative? Please tell me in the comments, is it literally breeding foxes or figuratively breeding foxes? Now I don't know. All right, well, thanks for joining me today. I'm Wendy Yi. This has been a great rapid fire roundup. I hope that you have some new games that you're interested in looking at from this. Let me know if you have any thoughts or feelings on any of these games, especially some of the ones that I gave lower scores. Have you played Arabella? Was I missing something? You know, what, what is there that I'm missing that I would love to know? Uh, thanks for joining me today. Once again, I'm Wendy Yee. This is the Dice Tower and uh, keep playing them games. Oh.